please welcome Roland Jensen. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for coming. For me, it's a triple pleasure to be here. First of all, to be invited by the Open Group to speak here as a non-member, but we think it's obviously very important for us also to look at, uh, at what's going on in the Open Group. The second pleasure is obviously to be in Paris. Paris is a nice city. And the third pleasure is, um, so I work for the Council of the European Union. I'm coming from Luxembourg, so I invite you to this Salle du Grand Luxembourg. Normally, we are Le Petit Luxembourg, one of the smallest countries in the European Union. So it's a pleasure for me to be in this meeting room, which is called the Large, the large Luxembourg. So um, what's going on, on on the Council? So today, I'm directly responsible for information and knowledge management at the General Secretary of the Council of the European Union. We are dealing with information management, knowledge management, but also innovation and projects in this respect. That sounds great, and I think it is, but a couple of weeks ago, so before summer, it was still called the Directorate for Document Processing and Document Management. So this shows already where we want to go. I think today the Council is very much active in legislative proceedings, and you cannot imagine legislative proceedings without any documents, and documents will not disappear from uh, today until tomorrow, but this indicates already the future that we are fully aware that in the future we cannot only deal with all our stakeholders on the basis of documents, we need to go to information and knowledge uh, management. So why did we do uh, to go on that way? First of all, a couple of words on what basically is the Council of the European Union? Most of you obviously know the Commission of the European Union. So the Commission, uh, la Commission Européenne, the European Commission, is the institution which tables proposals for new legislations, which looked at areas where it is necessary to get to European standards, to get to European ways of acting together. So the European Commission makes a proposal, and this proposal is submitted to the Council of the European Union and the European Parliament both being co-legislators. Now, a couple of years ago, the Council of the European Union was more like an intergovernmental conference, except for those areas already in the internal market. But more and more, and definitely since the Lisbon Treaty in 2009, we are a co-legislator, as is the European Parliament. So we have to act in a more uh, legislative uh, mindset, if we would compare it with the US, for example, we would together be the Congress, the European Parliament being the House, and the Council of the European Union being the Senate. So this step from intergovernmental to co-decision already obliges us to think differently, to get into a different interaction with the European Parliament and all our stakeholders, which are the member states. So in the Council of the European uh, Union, you have 28 member states uh, being represented by prime ministers, by technical ministers, and so on. But we also serve as a general secretariat the European Council. The European Council is uh, the forum where you have all prime ministers, all heads of states and governments coming together, where we have, since 2009, a standing president. So the first standing president, the, the president du Conseil européen, was Mr. Van Rompuy, now it is Mr. Uh, Tusk, and obviously this is a different institution. This institution is not active in legislation, in legislative drafting and preparation. This institution is acting in policy shaping at the highest level. And whenever you have a crisis in Europe, you will have the European Council meeting and deal with this crisis, be it in the Euro, be it on migration, be it on terrorism, what so on. And so we have also to serve our main leaders in this respect and to provide them with the right information, with the right knowledge in order to be able to assess, uh, to assess uh, crises and whatever is dealt with at this highest level. Finally, we have more and more requests from the uh, civil society. So we are uh, supposed to be a transparent organization, all institutions, by the way, and we have a regulation dealing with this, and we have to be able to provide whatever sort of information which falls under the remit of that regulation. 
So we cannot just hide behind facts that, well, we are not organized enough to find files or whatsoever. We need to deliver. And you have more and more NGOs looking at us, looking seriously at the business of the Council of the European Union and uh, waiting for equitability of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the European Union institutions. Yes. So, okay. So, over, ye over the years, the decision-making process changed, and I think that's not a secret. I think for 10 years now, we are running from crisis to crisis, and the policy problems get more and more complicated. And it's not a secret neither that uh, when we moved from a union of 15 member states to a union of 28, it got much more complex and complicated. And today, when we look at the way we exchange information on document-based information flows, it's obviously not the best way in order to deal smoothly, timely, and efficiently uh, in transborder information uh, exchange. So we had to reflect within the Council Secretariat what are the best processes enabling all our stakeholders to get the right information at the right uh, moment. In addition, uh, we cannot just limit ourselves to share and to circulate information. We have also to think how we valorize this information and how we create knowledge how we create the links between, between the different data in order to be of some added value for the member states and for uh, the citizens whenever it comes uh, to European Union policies. So after the why, so why did we do to do this, I would now go to what are we actually uh, doing? So as a general secretary of the Council of the European Union, we have to provide educated advice to our ministers, to delegates, whenever uh, they have to deliberate in their different areas. And it's not just, uh, as I said, high-level policy advice for the main leaders. It's also sometimes very, very technical advice in different files. When we speak, for example, about a European uh, public prosecutor, our colleagues have to know about judicial procedures in the member states. When we speak, for, for example, about uh, how to secure border controls, our colleagues again have to know what are the standards, what are the technologies which could today be applied at external borders of the European Union. So we have to be sure at the organization, at the heart of all that, to be, sh to be sure that we are able to get the right information to get the right uh, knowledge. We are permanent structure at European Union uh, level. What does this mean? We have a standing, a permanent uh, president of the European Council. But whenever it comes to the chair of the uh, Council of the European Union, we still have these rotating presidencies. That means that every six months, another member state of the European Union takes the lead of European Union affairs. So it was Luxembourg, for example, in 2015, followed by the Netherlands. Today, it's Slovakia. And so every six months, we have a different country with different ministers in the lead. And we have to ensure that there is continuity from presidency to presidency. Because, for example, when we have to negotiate with the European Parliament, uh, despite the fact that the share change, well, the line of negotiation has to be the same. There must be continuity, otherwise it will be very complicated and will be chaotic. And so, as we are this permanent structure, we have also to provide the tools in order to enable us to do, uh, to do this uh, job. In fact, we hold over 60 years of experience in this, in this field. But today, when you look back, it's not easy to get, uh, uh, to get through all this experience and knowledge. And what we see today is that most of that knowledge is individual-based, is in the hands of all our colleagues. And whenever someone moves, a lot of knowledge gets just moved. So we have to, to, sw to, to switch from individualized personal knowledge to more collective organization-based uh, knowledge. That's the only way we can ensure that con this continuity, and that's the only way we will be able to serve in the future in a more and more uh, uh, digitalized world. How can we do this? What are our specificities? How do we uh, work? So we are a small organization. 
If you look at our organization, we are not more than 3,000, and amongst these 3,000, you have more than 1,000 translators, as we also work in 24 official languages, which adds another layer of complication, because all these languages are official languages, and every legislation in whatever language has the right value. So our information, when it is shared, must be shared uh, within all the official languages, and it is just not possible uh, to ignore this. Our initial role was conceived more as a note-taker and archivist. Obviously, in today's world, this is no more possible. If it would just be like this, I could easily imagine that member states get organized in a way uh, that they organize themselves digitally around us, and then our role will just be the one of a note-taker. So we need to see how we can challenge our role, how we can question it, and how we can bring information and experience together in a more and more digitalized uh, world. When I say that um, we are a small organization, indeed, we are the smallest Brussels-based organization. Compared to the European Commission or compared to the European Parliament, we are really, really small. Oops. But we are somewhere at the center of a lot of interactions between the institutions, but also between um, member states. Let's see if the contact works. As I said, we are the smallest organization, but this does not mean that we are the smallest institution. That's something I hear very often that when I speak with colleagues from Commission or European Parliament, uh, that the uh, council, yes, we are the smallest institution. Is it, is it really so? When I look around me, in the Commission, yes, we have one president and uh, 27 uh, commissioners, members. We have to serve 28 presidents, plus one president of the European Council, plus one president of the Commission. We have to serve in each member states all ministers. This means that we have to serve hundreds of ministers around Europe. We have to serve all delegates coming to Brussels to meet. Every day we have more than 1,000 civil servants coming from all member states in order to discuss technical issues, to find compromises. If you add all this together, we have to serve several hundreds of political leaders and we have to serve experts in the front row, in the back office, in universities and so on to support all these services. So we easily have to serve a community of three, 400,000 uh, persons. And we have to get this information uh, uh, on, on the right place, in the right time, in the right languages. So you can imagine that we have, in today's world, to reassess a number, a number of issues. So how can we add context and connections in all the informations which are, uh, which are going to the Secretary of the Council? How can we link the information between the European Union institutions and between the member states? I will say in a couple of minutes, all the member states are in an e-government process, are in a digital government transformation process. We are somewhere in the middle, and we cannot just stay aside and look at them without acting or even without reacting. We have definitely to reassess how to manage the need to know. We are coming from a world where we only shared information on a strictly need-to-know basis. Today, it's no more possible. But on the other side, we cannot just share everything with everyone. That's not possible neither. We are still in a negotiation environment. So we definitely have to reassess how we get a, a new approach to a need-to-know in a more complicated uh, world. And we have also to see how we get member states' knowledge together. As I said, we are small organizations, so we do not have all the resources to get into all the knowledge we would, we would like to have. But around us, we have a lot of knowledge. And whenever there is a new proposal on, the, on something very technical in a very specific area, you have in member states initiatives going on, researchers, development centers, uh, um, um, uh, uh, innovators and so on, bringing their knowledge together, providing this knowledge to the national government. I believe that this knowledge could easily be shared with other national governments, with other administrations, with other stakeholders, and we might be in the right position for this 
to be some sort of an information and knowledge hub uh, to serve member states, where member states could bring their knowledge together and where we could provide something where everyone would take benefit of all the knowledge which is existing around Europe, be it on uh, the technical side, be it on the, on the policy side. We heard already just now from, um, uh, from, uh, from the previous speaker uh, that there are links between cities, how to improve digital services with regard to the citizens. Well, we could do the same on the member states level when we look at the larger policies in order to see what is all the knowledge already existing in the member states and we have difficulties today to bring it together and to share it much more as it, done, as it is done uh, today. So I see the future of our organization definitely in redefining added value uh, products, uh, added value services and products in order to make it happen. How can we do this? I think, well, one key enabler to do this is obviously standards um, and interoperability. Without standards and interoperability, it will just not be possible. And again, when I took over the directorate in 2014, what did I see? I saw that innovation processes were ongoing on the Commission side, other processes were ongoing on the European Parliament side, and in our house, similar processes were ongoing. And that over 20 years, every institution developed their own IT approach, their own IT culture, their own IT systems, and so on. Interoperability was not a question because we were still working with documents. And so what's the matter if we need just to do some conversions between one uh, institution and another one? And even today, believe me, when you look at the resources which are spent every year just for the conversion of documents between the Council, the European Parliament, and the Commission, it's just amazing. And so for the future, we launched last year a process at the level of Secretary General to ensure that in the future we are aiming at interoperable tools based on common uh, standards. We need also to focus on the areas where we really can add value. So uh, we, we need to get away from a collection-based approach. In the, in the past, we just collected the documents, we put them in boxes in the archives, and we kept them somewhere there. We need to get away from this. I think it's no more up to us to provide those collections. Those collections are everywhere. We need to make sure that it is able to link all the information and to find it in an easy and a smooth way. And the, the, responsibility, the responsibility of the, of the content, this should be left uh, to the author uh, and the owner of the information. So, from our perspective now, what are the, what are the challenges? Well, obviously it's to build the right systems. Uh, and that means not the right systems just for our house, but the right systems in interaction with the whole panel I just uh, explored. Uh, so we need to do it in partnerships. We need to do it in partnerships, first of all, with the European institutions, so with the Commission and with the European uh, Parliament. Uh, we will hear our colleague from the Commission a little bit later developing how, uh, how, we, can, uh, how we can have uh, similar standards and, and frameworks. This leads me to the second thing. We need to foster trust. We are moving in an unexplored territory, territory. And if we look together at all this together, so the institutions, the member states, a globalized world, it's not just enough to do it. We need to set a framework which triggers some trust and which allow us to do and work together. Uh, we also heard it just before, it's not just enough to introduce computerized IT tools if the processes are not fit to do this, if people do not trust in these systems, uh, it will be very, very difficult uh, to, to, to use them. And when I speak about the frameworks which could allow us to foster this trust, I would just mention three uh, very recent frameworks uh, um, set up in 2016. In May 2016, the Council adopted some conclusions on the digital single market technologies and public service modernizations under the Dutch presidency. And obviously, this concerns every stakeholder dealing with public administrations and e-governments. And what the Council insists on is saying that we need to go for seamless cross-border and digital public services, and there's a huge potential in this we need to explore. The Council also recognized the importance uh, of ambitious, 
coherent and consistent standardization policies and of timely and industry standards for interoperability. And finally, um, welcomes the dialogue between the Commission and the European standardization organizations. And if the Council takes this as guidelines for member states, obviously it also applies for the European institutions. It applies for the Commission, for the European Parliament, and for us. And we have to see how uh, we will use, in fact, these guidelines to meet, to, 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 to meet our stakeholders' expectations and to work more efficiently in, uh, in this world. The second framework uh, relates to digital and open government. Again, at the end of the uh, Dutch presidency, there was a conference in Amsterdam in June on digital open government, the next steps to maturity. And it was stressed that by default, we should go increasingly to uh, digital. We should go increasingly to open. We should be more user-driven and user-centered. Uh, uh, when I say open by default, uh, this links me immediately to open data. Uh, we have already, since 2013, European Council conclusions stating that by default, administrations should go for open data. We have the US administration, the Obama administration, which include open data as a default setting. We still need to have a common approach for European Union institutions. So for the Council, for example, we are now dealing with some open data projects, but we need to go for policy. And obviously, the policy on how we will deal with open data will also be a driver on how we will deal with digital transformation uh, at large. And finally, the third element I see as uh, uh, as very important as a framework is the e-government action plan 2016-2020. You probably all uh, have discovered in, in the meantime. And again, the Council calls on proactive contributions to the advancement of standardization agenda and, uh, on the basis of industry best practices and the latest technologies. And also the use on EIDA services in a digitally enabled business to facilitate the use of secure remote authentication, including mobile identification and trust uh, services. Again, this is crucial for us. I think we cannot work or we cannot develop the objectives, the challenges I just mentioned, without looking at standardization, without taking full benefit of standardization. And we have the same challenge as, for example, uh, the Mairie de Paris. Uh, all our stakeholders, our delegates, citizens, so use more and more mobile uh, devices. So we need to find secure remote authentication uh, access. Um, I think it's not a secret when I say that in a negotiation environment as the European Union, uh, there must be some sort of confidentiality. So we must be uh, sure also that our information is kept secure as long as it's needed to be kept uh, secure. And so uh, all this um, should enable us to get there. So I would also conclude with what um, uh, Mr. Grégoire just said. Uh, we cannot just do digital transformation for the beauty of the art. It's not because we have the technologies that we have to see how to put them into place. It's a question of acceptance. It's a question that the user sees the benefit uh, he or she has from all those technologies. So our focus is business driven. We see what are the tools. We see what are um, uh, the possibilities. Uh, but we need to create that link so that the user immediately feels that this is for me, uh, these are added value services I, uh, I, I valorize and I need to, to rely on. So as we have very limited resources, we have to see how to leverage these resources, and this is definitely possible with standardization and digital transformation uh, processes, and we have to see how to adapt our ways of working. Uh, in some respect, we are still a bespoke butler. For others, we are a procedural advisor. For others, we are a knowledge uh, broker. And to conclude, what does this mean? So as I say, we have to work on three fronts in parallel. The first one is internally. Without our organization, so the General Secretary of the Council, we have to, 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 to get completely digitalized workflows and validation processes, including e-signature and whatever is needed uh, for, secure, uh, for secure workflows. 
we have to get it right interinstitutionally. We cannot be isolated between the Commission and the European Parliament. For example, we are working now on an end-to-end -end legislative drafting platform, XML-based, between Commission, European Parliament and Commission. This is a tough project, as today we are coming from completely different uh, backgrounds, uh, but we need to get there. Uh, Acumentoso will not be another standard which will enable us in order to track and to mark legislative uh, processing. And finally, we have to get it right within 28 member states. We have to fit in their national e-governments and digital agendas. It's not us, just us imposing some new standards or tools or whatsoever on member states. No, this time we have to do it in interaction. We have to assess also what are the needs uh, on the other side of, uh, of, uh, of our boundaries, uh, again, I, I think I can only repeat what I, I heard. We work in silos. That it, you always will have limit, uh, limits and boundaries between services, but we need to work in a way so that we become boundaryless in the way our information circulates, and that's our main, uh, that's our main uh, challenge. And I think we will do it together with all our stakeholders. And uh, today we are not member of the open group, but I expect that uh, this will change in the, uh, in the future. And um, uh, that there's definitely also a need to work in this forum. Uh, and this, might, this will for sure be an added value uh, for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roland. If you could uh, please take a seat for some questions. I love presentations that talk about uh, the likelihood of joining the Open Group as a member. So that's a wonderful, wonderful start. And any any uh, presentation that has boundaryless information flow in the title is uh, is good news for us. It's our uh, it's our vision. Um, so thank you very much for uh, for doing that. Um, we've got quite a few questions that have come in uh, while you were talking. Um, let me start straight away. There are two that are very similar um, to do with security and confidentiality, yeah. basically. Um, and one is how are issues like security and confidentiality handled? The other similar one is how do you balance openness and confidentiality with security? Mm -hmm. I, I, that's, that's a really tricky and tricky issue. So to, uh, until now, more or less everything was dealt with uh, along the lines. So if this level of security is needed for that kind of information, so more or less all the information has to fit in that level of security. Mm -hmm. So it's just not possible to work in, uh, in a world which goes more and more mobile. So we have to find the right balance. But as I said, as we move from intergovernmental process to more co-legislation process, there are a lot of things which are public, which need to go public. So we need to make a, big, a greater distinction between those information, the content which can already be shared publicly and to take devices for that, which are there, and then to see more specifically what needs to be protected and then to protect it in an adequate uh, way. Uh, but again, I, I think all these are challenges. Uh, for example, major companies, uh, finance institutions, uh, law enforcement services, they have the same challenges. And in today's world, they are solutions. Uh, mm -hmm. We had the chance to see, for example, how in France, uh, national gendarmerie services function. And uh, so if it is possible there, it is also possible here. It's mm -hmm. a question of redesigning the way we assess and, and, um, uh, well, the content and to make a clear distinction between what can be shared publicly, openly, and to do it easily, to facilitate access, and then to protect really what needs to be protected with the right tools. Right, right. As you say, the, the, uh, I mentioned our, our vision of boundaryless information flow, and to finish it off, boundaryless information flow in a, in a secure, reliable, and timely manner. And we always stress that it doesn't mean that there are no boundaries, but the boundaries are permeable and enable uh, information to, to flow as it should in a secure way, not that, not that there are no boundaries. So it's a similar, similar issue both in, uh, at the EU level and, and commercial level, as you say. So, uh, okay, next question. Um, the EU, and notably France and Germany, is showing the world how to integrate refugees fleeing war-torn countries to pursue liberty and personal freedom. 
Given the complexity of culture, multiple languages, and technical and and the technical of digital technicality of digital differences, is the idea of an enterprise architecture to convey boundaryless information flow, as discussed, as a capability to build and govern. Um, so basically, is is the you know is the idea of an enterprise architecture to convey that. Uh, boundaryless information flow named or discussed? <laughs> well, um, I think this is an opportunity to me to say that what I say here is not uh, <laughs> reflecting <laughs> the position of institutions, it's just personally, but here we are entering into, into politics. I think uh, as I'm also coming from this justice and home affairs background, yeah. uh, these are discussions we have already uh, over the last 20 years, uh, but definitely uh, if I look, um, uh, there's a lot of knowledge which just got lost over 20 years. And if we have this sort of knowledge captured and shared, I'm pretty sure that, uh, well, whenever the next crisis will appear, we can say, okay, we had similar settings there, this was the solution, this worked, this didn't work, and for sure this will be enabled to work differently also at political uh, level. Uh, but now to answer your question, is it clearly mentioned? I said, no. No, but uh, I, I think there are a lot of uh, indications that it drives uh, in that direction. If you see a digital open market, well, uh, the, the common market was one of the, was the first building block of the European Union. Now we are getting to the digital open market, and whatever is linked to this digital uh, common market, uh, well, enables the European Union to progress. So I'm pretty sure that this will be another enabler to make the European Union uh, fit for, for growth. Mm -hmm. But it's not mentioned as that today. No. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, knowledge is based on information, which is based on foundational data. Uh, how is the EU language, in terms of connotation, nuance, and context, um, how does that arrive at the same perceived level of knowledge? Uh -huh. um, and and the, the comment with it is, it seems like the potential for inequality is quite considerable. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, they started a process uh, called uh, uh, European Strategy and Policy Analysis. Uh, um, it was called ESPAS, in order to see uh, what sort of perspectives the European Union would have. And what you say exactly here reminds me of a discussion we had a couple of months ago where someone said we should not get rid of the uh, l'ambiguité constructive, so the constructive ambiguity. Uh, but I think in today's world, our citizens do not expect from us constructive ambiguity. Uh, they want from us a clear language. Uh, of course, there must all, always be some work for courts and, and so on, but we need to find a different language in order to make the European Union more accessible also to the interested citizen. And definitely today, it's very complicated if you're interested in European affairs to find the right knowledge on our different websites. And so I think that's also another challenge uh, so that we enable the citizens to get the information a correct, authentic information where it is. Um, I was in Columbus uh, over Samba uh, at the at World Conference on uh, Information and Library Exchange, and there was a guy from Wikipedia, and he called the libraries to provide information. So, one reflection could be, why can't we as European institutions, for example, not provide information to Wikipedia so to facilitate all this? Okay, yeah, good point. Standards, next question. Um, you talked about standards and interoperability as, as key. Um, do you see standards as beneficial for sharing as, as compared to documents, for example? Um, and do you see standards as a way to share and reuse knowledge? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's uh, no, no doubt about that. Uh, what we intend to do in the future today, when we take a document, when we take a pro commission proposal with 250 pages with all the annexes, and we just treat it as one single document, how do you want to work on this in terms of knowledge management? The idea would be we go for 
content-based, we take uh, area by area, articles by articles. So X XML will definitely be the, the tool for content exchange in the future. And for us, we had to look at different standards, Akumontoza, in order as a legislative tracker is the right thing to do. And if other organizations, if member states, for example, in the framework of the ISA Square program, uh, together with, uh, with the Commission's building blocks we will hear in a couple of minutes, if we all do this together on the basis of the same standards, well, it, we will uh, provide knowledge, we will be more efficient uh, with less resources and, 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 uh, and reserving those resources for other things. Music to our ears, yes, thank you. Uh, I think this is the last question. Um, what is the approach that you take to handle all the information so it will be updated and in time? And are you using a reference model to handle this and connect all the data and knowledge together? That's definitely one of the challenges. Uh, today, we are not yet able uh, to deliver information in the right time in a structured way. So if we want to do something in an urgent way, so it's email exchange. Huh? Mm -hmm. And whenever you use email exchange, you will lose things during the process. Huh? And I think that's one of our challenges to find, or the reference model to allow us to be uh, quick and efficient but still organized so that everything remains captured and uh, available for future uh, exchanges and and but that's one of one of the main challenges mm -hmm. to, to, to mm -hmm. take yes so a reference model may be something that Absolutely. you that you Absolutely. come to yeah. okay and i misspoke there is one more one more question um, how can the council of the eu make sure that the stakeholders trust the tools and methods in time so as not to impact the delay in the delivery of those projects um, and part B, how is reluctancy to accept those treated? <laughs> Just one single word, partnerships. Uh, again, over the last years, because it's complicated to set up IT system compliant with all stakeholders, we just developed on our own and we informed, well, that's it, guys. Today, we have to do this in partnership with the member states. So we came to France to see how the SGAE functioned. We were in Vienna, we were in Estonia, which is digitally uh, one of the fittest countries. Uh, and so we explored and we offer those, this sort of partnerships with, the most, with those who would like to, to join us. So it's, it's a win-win situation at the end. Uh, they might see, oh, if those guys in Brussels are able to, to develop this, it's no more use for us to develop it in parallel, so we can, and, but it has to be done together. It can no more be that uh, in Brussels things are developed and just imposed. We have to do this together with the member states, with commission, with the parliament, and, and I think at least in Brussels this mindset is now clear, and, uh, and if you look at those framework contracts, as those con uh, programs with, as ISA Square and so on, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's one of, uh, of the vehicles to get there. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's all the, all the questions, so thank you once again all along for your presentation and um, big round of applause for our speaker, please. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you very much.